you know, can you, the whole notion of, uh, of journalism is kind of presupposing the distinction between the observer and the event. But if this distinction itself is being problematized, then you can get a, a very different, uh, very different situation. So, which is not to say that journalism is kind of in, invalid or void, no, it's just but that, that it needs to be... It makes it, it makes it a really good one to look at, actually, yeah. you know, for that reason. Really. Yeah. 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 And especially now that, you know, um, the crisis that befall mm. journalism, the crisis of new media, yeah. and now they talk a lot about network journalism, yeah. uh, and what is network journalism? It's just an attempt to salvage some kind of traditional understandings mm. while acknowledging that yes, there is technology, there is kind of you know, citizen journalism and all these things. Uh, however, we can still preserve some kind of core values. Mm. But I think it's a lost button. Uh, not, none of these things can be productively preserved. And the only way is to really engage seriously with technologies mm -hmm. and, uh, and how technologies actually throw questions of subjectivity mm -hmm. in both of your very nice questions. I always think that Twitter is like a photograph. I agree. The, you know, the tweet mm -hmm. is like, it is, is doing all, all the things that a photograph is doing. Twitter is ways. fascinating and it's very, very hard to understand. Twitter. Yeah. Um, it's one of the hardest things to really to figure out because it's un, it's completely non-linear. You know, like in the, in, in the, with with tweets, you can attach a hashtag yeah. and completely redirect it. Yeah. Now, and that is just just different. Yeah. It's really not something like like nothing else. And, and completely uncontrollable. Yeah. For for that reason, uh, reason uh, when they had the Levinson inquiry, yeah. it really didn't go anywhere because they couldn't understand how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what is the point of having some kind of uh, journalism law yeah. or regulation if you don't understand? <coughs> no. Are we starting? Should we start? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I I, I didn't realize we're already. <laughs> In the session, <laughs> just chatting away. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for coming. And uh, well, you know, uh, well, my name is Daniel. Um, and it's good to be here again. I was looking forward to it because it's such a rare opportunity just to sit down and think about things for a few hours. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, now, Johnny left me with this thing she said that this session is supposed to be about quantum physics uh, which is fine um, however I'm not going to talk about Einstein because that's kind of not my interest and not my thing I'm more interested in um, trying to, to understand how physics and art and philosophy um, share a certain territory, but also go in, do different things with it. So I could talk a little bit about that using um, some examples from from quantum physics around chaos. So I was thinking that I, so I, I could talk about the way chaos theory feeds into our understanding of art, but also into notions of desire. And um, I, I think you did with Johnny in the past, uh, Morning and Melancholia, Freud, all, the, all, all, all these sort of things. However, there is another possibility. I could just um, open it up for you and ask what you want this session uh, to be about. If, if there are any kind of questions that remain unanswered, you know, <laughs> as if, and <laughs> then, <laughs> then, then we could uh, talk about something like that. Uh, because I, I thought you will have, um, you will have to submit your essays for tomorrow. I thought it might be, might be useful for you to go uh, over some points. So, um, so unless I'm ha happy to do the sort of thing I was planning, unless you have uh, something to do. No? You okay with my with my evil plan? <laughs> okay. I'm mean, you know, particularly yeah. interested, like you were talking about <coughs> Twitter there. Mm -hmm. Things like Twitter coming to it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Actually, um, I, I'll, I'll, I will continue. If that's not too. No, no, I can send you a link. 
um, I just uh, finished a chapter with a colleague um, that, while it's not dealing with Twitter as such, is dealing with algorithms. Um, and Twitter is algorithm. That's why it's kind of um, interesting. Okay, now. So. <laughs> So let me tell you what what is uh, going to be about. But do but do uh, interrupt and interject because I don't have a two-hour lecture to give you. I have a kind of story, but it's an open-ended narrative, so we can take it into any direction you want. Um, essentially, essentially, I want to talk to you about how chaos came to play really important role in the way we understand contemporary culture, both in terms of politics and science and art. And once we start talking about chaos, um, then obviously Deleuze and Guattari's um, work, especially this book, What is Philosophy, becomes really important. Um, you probably will um, come to it a bit later, but it's, a, it's absolutely a wonderful book. Um, it's the, the last one they wrote when they both were um, quite old. By the way, I just wanted to say that um, there is a DVD of Deleuze. It's called Abecedere. Uh, it's, a, it's a long interview with Deleuze um, by Claire, uh, Claire Piaget, I think her name. You, you, you know about it? Yes. Yeah? It's, it's, it's really wonderful. And recently it was, it, it was released with English subtitles. It's, a, it's basically it's a kind of French way of doing interview. Uh, where the interviewee responds to each letter of the alphabet. So, so Claire, who is the interviewer, says, OK, A will be animals, B will be drinking, C, and, 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 and so on. W is Wittgenstein. You know, Z is zigzag, which is the most important. Um, and, and then he just kind of jumps for a few minutes on each one of these topics. I say it's really, well, if you want to see the measure of the man, kind of Deleuze and Plant, you need to watch that. And it's moving to tears because he died very soon after. You know, do you know how he died? No. Yeah. Um, well, he, he suffered from an illness, uh, from a respiratory, re respiratory illness. Um, <coughs> Not exactly like asthma, but, but he was uh, in the last years of his life. He was all the time with a kind of oxygen uh, balloon, um, taking oxygen from it. Um, so breathing was a problem for him. Um, it's very interesting, actually. I don't want to, to go into to too many trajectories, but it's interesting how philosophers that deal with difference, like Spinoza, Nietzsche, Deleuze, the Russian philosopher Bakhtin, somehow physical fragility and illness play a part in thinking difference. I think as long as, long as you are in rude health, um, rep representation and identity make a lot of sense. But, but um, when you are fragile, then this notion of different being different, you know, and but because you know, illness is a form of difference, is a form of disability. Um, so anyway, that, 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 that's a completely different story. And, and it's, it's interesting that Deleuze has also this book uh, of um, literary essays that call, it's called Essays Critical and Clinical. But anyway, uh, so he was, uh, he was in his 70s. No, in his, in his 60s. He was born in 1925. Um, and, and the idea of this interview was that it would be released soon after his death. And then soon after giving this interview, um, he took a tram from the house outside Paris where, uh, where he uh, retired, came back to this Parisian flat, and uh, threw himself out of the window. And, um, and it's actually interesting, I was reading that people who suffer from this uh, breathing illness, they often jump out of a window. It's a kind of intake of air happens when you throw yourself out. So if for that reason, very often um, uh, respiratory illnesses, wards uh, um, that deal with respiratory illnesses are placed on the ground floor of a hospital. Um, <coughs> those people have this tendency of, uh, of throwing, defenestrating themselves. 
Um, so I, I think um, it's just inter really interesting to watch and, and you will fall in love with the man, how he sits there and he is, he is so kind of gentle and sometimes you can see him really irritated with some of the questions and also this Claire, she's sitting there and she's smoking all the time which I think is also quite, <laughs> <laughs> quite amazing and he's there like, <laughs> trying to make his answers to this cloud of smoke, sometimes you don't even see him um, it's a long interview, it's two, two DVDs but it's, it's about 20 pounds, really worth um, getting <clears throat> what, what's the title of the game? it's called um, Apicellar or something like that um, I mean if you go to Amazon and there is only one DVD with the so it's, uh, okay. it's just there um, there's the diabetes of it on YouTube so you can go and watch a couple just to get flavor, the, the flavor but uh, to me it was just like you know the, uh, the Nirvana MTV gig the, the, the unplugged gig when you really see you know kind of just, just the guys, you know, by themselves. It's, it's just wonderful. That, 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 that's the sort of feeling I get. Okay, <laughs> back to because one loop and we start another. So anyway, so that, that's, that's, that's the book they wrote um, towards, um, towards the very end, the, the, what, what is philosophy. And it's a book when they try to come to terms with the question of chaos. And they do it through approaching it um, in a kind of triangulating it through questions of philosophy, science, and art. And these are quite traditional categories, and all those kind of classical metaphysical categories. So it's quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> I will come back to that in a minute. But um, my way into the whole question starts from another place. The way I want to start is by um, telling you a little bit about an article by Karl Popper and uh, it's called Of Clouds and Clocks. Did you hear of it? Yes, it oh, Johnny mentioned it. No, I came across it when I, and I couldn't work out what to make of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think when I was writing my essay, mm -hmm. would it, yeah, would it have been in um, Mountain Plateau since it, it, could, it, it could be mentioned by them. Yeah. By them, I don't know that. It, it could be. I have no idea. Yeah. But yeah. Um, Karl Popper. Um, just I would say two words about him. He's um, one of the most significant English writing uh, philosophers. Um, he has a bad reputation uh, for being a positivist. Um, so uh, being kind of the the last person you would associate with um, kind of the philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari, um, and he would associate himself with, uh, with that. Um, but um, he was writing around the mid 20th century, so let's say 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and um, his work, I think, deserves, deserves your attention. Uh, but I just want to talk about this one lecture he gave. It's called Of Clouds and Clocks. And about the um, problem he poses there, because it's such a powerful metaphor. Um, clouds on the one hand, clocks on the other. You can just see where he is going with that. He basically says that since the Enlightenment, or since the scientific revolution of the 17th century, yeah, just briefly to name a few names, um, Galileo Galilei, um, Newton, Copernicus, Immanuel Kant, yeah? Um, so, so the 17th century, the, the, the age of reason, you know, that extracted humankind from the bondage of the Middle Ages and from the slavery to religion, um, from that point onwards, the world is very much a clockwork world. <coughs> it's very much like a clock. What what is meant by that? I hope I hope it, it, you well. Newton spoke about the clockwork universe, and um, what does it mean to say that, that that the universe is like a clockwork? It means that it is um, predictable, rational, and based on very determinate laws. Yeah, so. 
you know, as an example, um, Newton came up with his laws of motion. Yeah, uh, and actually Newton, in his uh, Principia Mathematica, speaks about but well, he didn't know what to do with God in his uh, in his system. Because then Newton was a very religious man and uh, um, an alchemist <coughs> as well as a scientist. Um, so so he, his solution to God was that God create this clockwork universe wound the spring and left it ticking over tick tack tick tack and um, and it all works you know if you look at the skies and you see the all the stars and the sun and the moons and everything moves in their orbits like the wheels of a giant clock and everything moves with perfect precision you can calculate exactly and know when Venus will appear you know the Galileo demonstrated, demonstrated all that um, <clears throat> the reason all these calculations are possible is because the universe is this giant clock um, so so one example of it is Newton's laws of motion and um, there are three of them do you know the laws of motion? you, you, you familiar with them? the laws of motion? it's interesting huh? It's, it's kind of, uh, people sometimes say, it's a very famous argument, that not to know Newton's laws of motion is like not to know who is Shakespeare, you know, so it's, uh, but, uh, but, action reaction. Oh, you're absolutely right, that's, that's, that's the whole thing, action reaction, yeah, that's the third law. There are basically three laws of motion. The first law says that a body in movement will move indefinitely until some forces will operate on it. Yeah? So if you, you say fire a cannonball in perfect vacuum without any gravitational fields, it will just move indefinitely. Yeah, that's the first law. Um, it's interesting how these laws immediately have kind of political aspect. The other is that um, force is equivalent to mass multiplied by velocity or agitation. Yeah? Again, you can just see how it's kind of has all immediate kind of political implications. You know? So you have a mass of people and if you want to make a movement, then you need to agitate them. And if it's a you know and the more you agitate, the greater the outcome will be. And and the last one is as you said, is that every action um, has a reaction. What does it mean? Imagine that, let's say, you stand uh, on a boat in the river, you know, and you want to step from the boat to the bank. If you are not careful, as you step on the bank, the boat will move to the other side and you will fall in the water, yeah? Because your action of moving forward is equivalent to, to, to the same action of pushing the boat back, yeah? Now, this again, this is a very political thing. Um, all these laws basically mean that the world is made of discrete entities like cannonballs and boats and, and bodies so they, they are made of discrete entities and these laws are universally applied there are no exceptions to these rules you know there is no case in which action does not cause the reaction you know it's always like that so these are very powerful things this is this, this is really strong stuff. I mean, if you want to put, not, you know, not, not, not to mention cannonballs and building bridges and stuff, if you want to put um, a satellite into the orbit, you only need these three loads. You only need to, to um, fire the satellite with sufficient force, so it will break through the gravitational field, and the second law of Newton will allow you to calculate with precision how much force is required. And, and you're there. So, you know, it even allows such things as space travel. So, um, so that's why Karl Popper can say that for, since the 17th century onward, the universe is a clock. Now, he goes on, he, he plays with it uh, quite nicely in, in this lecture. He goes on also to say that um, as we look at the, at the world, we can see that 
there are some things that kind of don't exactly fit the clock model, you know, and there are, there are things which are kind of more like clouds. So clouds for him are things which are um, less maybe uh, determinant that, that contain some element of uh, of chaos in them. So he, for instance, he says clearly a newborn baby is a bit more of a cloud than a grown-up person. You know, a soldier is more clockwork, for instance, and uh, or, for, or he even says that. Uh, I think a cat is more cloudy and a dog is more clockwork. Yeah, uh, and I think he he says that um, something like a good German car is is a better clockwork than uh, than some uh, Italian jello for instance. Uh, so um, so so that's kind of the model if if our understanding of the world before the scientific revolution was kind of more cloudy you know more leaning towards some kind of indeterminacy or just unpredictability you know like even like with the cloud it's hard to um, kind of be very precise about its shape then since the 17th century, you know, the tendency is generally towards this clockwork universe. And because he is basically um, interested in the understanding of the world through physics, um, his argument is that the, the, the model of the world physics put forward is one of clockwork. Okay, so that's, that's the starting point. When it becomes interesting, is when he brings this whole story to the beginning of the 20th century, where starting with um, thermodynamics and later with particle physics, um, and which later you know segues into Einstein's theory of relativity and quantum physics, the whole clockwork model gets kind of destabilized and challenged. Suddenly. It's not, entirely, it's not entirely certain anymore that the world is a big clock and kind of cloudy <laughs> wisps of clouds and kind of cloudy elements start to appear here and there uh, causing a lot of concern because, uh, for instance, one of the early discoveries that kind of bring in this the, the cloudy element is the Brownian motion. The Brownian motion is something I, I was taught in school I didn't know how useful it would be later on. Um, but it's just about, uh, it's, it's before quantum physics, um, just about the motion of gas molecules in, a, in any kind of closed uh, sphere. Um, if, let's say, this bottle was, was, uh, had just gas inside it, and we could observe the molecules, we could see that they move in a kind of unpredictable, chaotic movement. Or, you know, if you... Um, at home, sometimes uh, in the summer, uh, if you remember the summer, there is a there, there, there can be a beam of light and like dust in in the beam, and you know how how this kind of dust flickers and moves, you know, and it's an unpredictable movement. It's chaotic, yeah. So when people started to pay attention to that kind of thing, which you know even the Greeks and the Romans knew about, you know, Lucretius. Uh, <coughs> But, but once you start paying attention to this kind of thing, then you realize that there are these elements of unpredictability and unpredictability which operate within this global system. So the, the Brownian motion brings in this idea of random, unpredictable movement with these um, specks of dust in, in the beam of light. There's absolutely no way of telling where a certain speck will move next. It's really, it's really impossible to tell. It's not because we don't have the information. It's just unpredictable. It's just chaotic. Um, and when people started to look at the behavior of um, um, neutrons and um, on a, a subatomic level, then they realized that 
this notion of unpredictability is actually the governing principle of uh, nuclear physics. Yeah? Now, that, that's really where things become quite hairy for Karl Popper, because, because let's think about politically for a second. Because I think, you know, the, really the, the main reason for me to be interested in physics is because of the very direct connection between physics and politics, and for that reason also with art. Um, because, you know, I have to say from the start, um, I'm not a physicist, and I really don't claim to be able to explain the, the things I'm talking about in any um, great depth. But I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that, because, as we were saying earlier, um, about you know not reading uh, Heidegger, for instance, in the original German language. It's it's kind of okay, you know, because the question is, does it make sense, and can you do something with it? You know, so um, so what is interesting is how the clockwork model of the universe was very kind of helpful for establishing a certain political order. Um, around the notion of the subject, around the notion of representation, political representation, and um, perhaps uh, some kind of um, civil society in which every action causes a reaction, yeah, in which there are laws, and the laws are universal, um, and the society is governed by certain fixed rules given from above, in the same way that the physical world is governed by these fixed laws of motion given by the watchmaker. Um, so it is interesting, isn't it, so that at the same time when Newton came up with these laws of motion, um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau came up with his theories about the rights of men, about representation, um, about the right of the individual subject to be politically accountable as rational entity and to be politically represented. Some of these things seem to be connected. The, the, the rationality of the Newtonian universe finds its counterpart in the rational uh, liberal state. All right. Um, is, does it make sense so far? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, but do uh, if you have any concerns or objections, then then, then please um, say something. Um, so, do you okay. think it was a? Um, do you think it might have been an opportunity for Rousseau to start putting those things rather than it being a coincidence? I don't think it's. I don't think at all it's a coincidence. No. I think it is a, a movement. A, a, a kind of a movement that sweeps throughout the whole of the Western world, mm -hmm. where um, it's all driven by what Kant expressed in these two words. I'm sure Jenny told you many times, "Sapere aude, dare to know," mm -hmm. you know, as the key to self-liberation, mm -hmm. as the key to freedom. Now, this "dare to know" basically says, "Represent the world to yourself." Don't rely on the external power mm. of either God or King, mm. uh, to give or the priest or the teacher, to give you knowledge or wisdom or rights. Um, do it yourself, mm. and because then, then you are free. You don't need the, this external authority. And uh, if you are in the position to acquire your own knowledge, then you don't need someone to tell you um, what is right and what is true. Mm -hmm. And the reason you can claim knowledge is because you claim rationality. Mm -hmm. You start from saying, I'm a rational human being. Um, I can represent the world to myself rationally. I can see the world moving according to rational principles which I can comprehend. Therefore, I am the one in charge here. You know? So therefore, I, I, I cannot be someone's slave 
or a serf, um, I am a, a autonomous human being. Yeah. Now that comes with a big caveat. We're not going to we're not going to go into it today. But this incredible liberation and this really massive. I mean, it's it's a, it's a fantastic thing. This idea that you don't need the father figure or the god figure to tell you what to do because you can within yourself find out because you possess rationality it's amazing it has it has its own dark side this very rationality also delimits exactly what you can do and what you can do the moment you declare yourself a rational subject and that's the kind of thing that Heidegger later would take issue with um, everything that falls outside of rationality becomes inaccessible to you so but that's that's a kind of different story. I don't think I don't think I'm, I want to get into today. Otherwise, we will get we will be here for a long time. But it would be it would be interesting. But I just, I just want to get to a, um, we're almost going to discuss that, but from a slightly different direction, I think, because I want to get to a point where this democratic state, which is based, as we said somehow also on the rational principles of science and physics. Um, somehow wakes or shakes because the same physics now discovers this really irrational, chaotic, unpredictable heart. So if we take seriously the quantum the claims of quantum physics that say and on the on a subatomic level, the behavior of particles is unpredictable and unknowable. In principle, no, it's not unknowable because we don't have a big enough microscope. It's not unknowable because we need a, a bigger computer. And it, it, it's just because you cannot know. I will explain later um, why is that. I will try to really show you what is it exactly this taking place there. But let's just take it at the moment as um, something that we accept, as a given, that once we take that seriously, this claim of undecidability or, um, or unknowability, we take it seriously, then what kind of society we're going to get? If chaos is really the basis and the foundation of the world, as we know, then we then then what? Then everything in life is decided by a throw of a metaphysical dice. Yeah? Then, then this secure foundation of the state seems to be in in a perilous condition. Now don't forget that Popper is writing at the moment, you know, when there are serious concerns precisely about that. Um, the, the exactly the, the midpoint of the twentieth century. So, so chaos, you know, seems to be not restricted to quantum physics. It seems to seep over into politics, uh, into fascism, for one thing, into communism, which for Popper was all equally dangerous, Marxism, Hegel. Uh, so, um, so this. The cloud now, the amorphous, nebulous, indeterminate cloud becomes a more dominant model. And the clockwork seems to be kind of suppressed. Or at least we discover that the clock is actually made of clouds. And the part of the clock where we expected to find, you know, um, cogs and wheels, there are some kind of clouds. You know, it's, it's unreliable. Um, you know, is, is it is is there any wonder that people like Dostoevsky or Nietzsche were so concerned? Um, that was long, that was in the 19th century. But Dostoevsky and the brother, brothers Karamazov uh, gets uh, Ivan Karamazov say, "But if there is no God, then everything is permitted." And and you can see that how that applies to quantum physics, if if there is indeterminacy on this level, then everything really is permitted. Then how can you build a 
liberal society on, based on some principles um, that will not descend into chaos. And clearly, you have a problem because it seems like the only way is to have some kind of uh, police state, you know, with uh, torture chambers and secret police, and then maybe you will be able to keep all this chaos in check. But at what political cost? So you see, for Karl Popper, the discoveries of quantum physics, and particularly um, the, the discoveries of um, um, What's his name? Um, of um, Sch Sch Schrodinger and uh, sorry, of of uh, Schrodinger, were um, were deeply disconcerting. Now I want to stop here and show you what is actually taking place on this quantum level. So we will be um, so we will understand what is really at stake, and you will also see how this quantum moment I want to describe to you is actually somehow the point at which you can draw out both art and science and philosophy as kind of having an interesting relationship. And the thing I want to show you is the Schrodinger cat experiment. Do you know about the cat? The Schrodinger cat? Yeah? So you, you, you know how that works. So you, can, you can help me if I get confused because it's, uh, it's not... It's not the simplest thing. By the way, I think this is this is a really good book. Um, Roger Penrose, it's popular science, um, and he wrote some others. Uh, this this is one of the. I, I bought this one because it was cheap. And the the, um, the the books he wrote later, as well. But he explains all these things: the like quantum, the relativity, or the fractals. Um, it's. Um, it explained explained very well. Um, anyway, so now Schrödinger was a um, Schrödinger He was a physicist, um, and he worked in quantum physics. His concern was with precisely the kind of. Uh, um, claims people started to make about applying quantum physics to the bigger world. He said that it's silly. That quantum, the, the undecidability of quantum physics, he accepted it, he acknowledged it, but he said it only applies to this subatomic level. It does not really transcend beyond to the world at large. And in order to prove that, he proposed the Schrodinger cat experiment, the cat experiment. Um, and the experiment is can be described in, in several ways and the one I'm using here um, seems to work for me maybe because it has a kind of a photographic dimension to it but anyway in, the, um, in this experiment we have a box with a cat Okay, so <clears throat> we have a box with a cat. Now, here there is, it starts very sweet, but it's quite a gruesome experiment. Um, here there is a, a particle generator. It's like a gun that can fire a single particle, a photon, for instance, or an electron. Yeah? So while, while it's a normal torch, just sends a beam of light. You can imagine it's a kind of torch that sends one particle of light. You know, the, the smallest available unit, just one unit. Now, this, this particle will be fired this way. And here, it hits a semi-silvered um, semi mirror. It's a kind of mirror that reflects half the light and transmits half the light. 
in SLR cameras, in, digi in, in, in photographic cameras, there is this kind of mirror that allows you to see what is happening while at the same time reflecting light to the lens. Yeah? Now, if you just shine a torch into this mirror, then 50% of the light will go this way and 50% of the light will go that way. Yeah? But if you just fire one particle, that the particle cannot be split, it's just one particle. Yeah? So there is 50% chance that it will go that way and 50% chance that it will go this way. Yeah? So, okay. And here, that's the sad thing. Here, the evil Schrodinger puts a glass uh, test tubes, test tube with, let's say, cyanide or something like that, and the light sensitive device. So, if the particle of light hits that spot, the glass breaks, cyanide is released, and the cat dies. Yeah? Okay. So, what we have here is either it goes this way. Or it goes this way. Okay, so that's that's the experiment. Now, so there is a fifty percent chance for a cat to be dead, and fifty percent chance to be alive by the end of this experiment. So now, we need to have two observers for that to make sense. One observer is inside the room. Now, Penrose wisely suggested that the observer should be wearing some kind of protective gear, because uh, it might be dangerous. Why the cat shouldn't wear protective, protective gear, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. so. so that's the observer here inside the room. Now, outside the room, there is a measuring device. and another observer. Okay. All right. That reads the data from, um, uh, from uh, uh, that is completely sealed. Yeah? So there are no windows. And of course, it is in total darkness, because we only need this one particle of light for that to happen. So. So, is there any, anything we're missing here? I think, I think we can see how that work, how how that works. For the observer who is inside the room, once the particle is fired, one of two things will happen. Either the cat is, either the glass uh, beaker is broken and the cat is dead, or the particle passed through and the cat is alive. Yeah? And for the person inside the room, it is one or the other. However, for the person who is outside the room, who is taking the measurement of what is happening, um, this whole situation is in the state of indeterminacy because as long as the particle is unobserved, it can be statistically anywhere in the room. And only the act of measurement forces it to be in one place or the other. You know? That's one of these peculiar things about quantum physics, that the act of measurement itself changes the situation, the measured situation. Yeah? It's almost like you know if you place if you put a thermometer in a glass of in a glass with water, then in a sense the the temperature of the water can change from by placing the thermometer inside it. Yeah, but with uh, in in quantum physics, the 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 key condition is that the act of measurement is the one that, fo that forces the electron or the photon to choose its right place whether in whether here or there and as long as the measurement 
is not made, the, the cat is in a state of indeterminacy. It is both dead, or well, it's, it's both dead or alive, or neither dead or alive. But what is interesting here, and what is really kind of the, the key for what I'm going to talk about in a minute, is that we have here two, two versions of the same event. So for the, for the person outside, the cat is both dead and alive. And for the person inside, there is determinacy. There is either the one or the other. So that indicates a kind of moment where our habitual ways of thinking about linearity or causality seem to not to work very well. Because that's exactly the place, that's exactly the moment where difference starts to happen. There is a difference between the two observers. They, they, they inhabit different states. Yeah? They inhabit different states of knowledge in regard to this event. And they are unreconcilable. So this is quite interesting. It looks, the, it looks like the experiment <coughs> captures the, in a very tangible way, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a mind experiment. It's not something that can be really um, made. It's, 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 a, it's a theoretical experiment. But it captures the moment where difference makes its appearance in the physical world. And it makes its appearance in the different states of knowledge between the two, the, the two observers. So this is, this is quite complex stuff. This is really outside of the way we normally think about, well, about the world. Because isn't it also the case that kind of the, the time also starts to behave in a different way? I would almost be tempted to say that at this moment, that, that for, for the person who is inside the room, there is a kind of linear time that we are familiar with. And and that there is a clear sense of cause and effect. But for the person who is outside, and even more significantly, for, for the one who is thinking about the incommensurability of these two events, <coughs> some other time is, is happening. The last calls. The, this notion of time, ion, a i o n, um, which is the time of the event as opposed to the chronological time of the ticking clock. This time of the event, <coughs> what the Greeks also called kairos as opposed to chronos, because the Greeks also had two two notions of time. They had the chronos, the chronological time, and Kairos, which is a, much more at the moment, the, the time of the now, much more the kind of the, um, what um, Nietzsche calls the ecstatic temporality of the ease, the, the present moment. OK. <clears throat> this is complicated. Can you ask uh, yeah, yeah. The person outside doesn't know that there are only two uh, possibilities. Yeah. He knows that there are only two possibilities, but uh, he has his only way of knowing which one is the actual is to take a measurement. But it is the measurement that will create the actual state. But the measurement would be like one or two? Like, if, I mean, can the measurement show something different instead of the 
those two possibilities? No. The measurement can the measurement will force the imagine that there is no person inside. Just the cat. Yeah? And okay, let's let's say the cat is, is not a sentient being. So for the person here, once the particle was released. The, the particle is statistically anywhere in the room. It can be anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Is there a possibility to hit the, the mirror and not go to the to the bottom? You know how particles famously sometimes behave like waves? Yeah? So what well, that means that that it's not lo the laws of causality as you know that govern let's say the the cannonballs. So it's, it's it's not the Newtonian laws of cause and effect or action and reaction, but it's more like statistical distribution. Statistically, this particle. I think I think I, I see I see what you mean. Yeah, I'm sorry. I probably didn't, didn't get it right. T statistically, the particle can be anywhere in the in the space, and, and there are different probabilities for it to be in different parts of the room. But this, these statistical probabilities are very of, of very different order than the Newtonian laws of motion. Yeah. So with, with Newton, the, there is no probability, there is no statistics. If you know the mass and velocity of something, you can know exactly where where to find it in the universe. Yeah, so you can, if you are in the right place in the right time in the space, and you will put your hand, you will have the ball will just land there with precision because you can calculate exactly. With with particles, it doesn't work like that because they don't operate according to these laws. They operate according to a different set of parameters. And here, statistics, rather than causality, start to, to play an important role. And the statistical distribution can only be, will only stop once a measurement is taken. And it is the measurement that will force the particle to, as, to assume a certain position, either here or there. But before the measurement, the particle is, in a sense, everywhere at once, statistically. And therefore, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. This is, it's never going to be any simpler or any easier than that. Um, and, you know, it's a truism to say that with, with quantum physics, if, if it starts to make sense, then probably you didn't quite understand it. <laughs> because it's... It's not um, the the laws of reason and logic that we are trained on and we use in our uh, daily life and in our um, dealings with the world don't seem to apply here in the same way. But what what we do, what I want, kind of what I want to try to to get to is not only it's not only the point is not only that for the external observer. The cat is both dead and, dead and alive because the particle can be anywhere. The point, but the point that I'm really interested in is that there is a difference of it, of, there is a real difference in the, well, let's say knowledge between, or in the experience between these two observers. So it, look, it looks like what is being captured is precisely that there is some kind of multiplicity. That's where multiplicity comes into being. You know, there is one story here, one narrative, which is logical and Newtonian, you know, this or that. And there is another narrative here, which is statistical, uh, probabilistic, um, and unclear, indeterminate, and they coexist. It's not that one is correct and the other is not. 
they coexist. Um, and according to Newton, they cannot, they cannot coexist. We know from Newton that two things cannot really occupy the same space uh, at the same time, but here it looks like they can. Yeah? So, so, you know, forgive me if, I cannot, if I'm not making it very clear. It's not very clear for me either. Um, but what I think you can get out of it with some level of clarity, or at least with some kind of level of insight, is that there is a kind of bifurcation taking place. Now, I, I, I would like to just hold on to it for a second and say, isn't that exactly the same kind of bifurcation that feminism is arguing for? When it says, well, there is a plurality of positions. There is uh, Lucie Rigaray, uh, who is a wonderful um, writer and uh, a wonderful philosopher. She talks about it a lot. She, tells, she says, <coughs> if we take feminism seriously, then it's not the point is not to say that we need to uh, give the woman kind of the, the same powers that the men had. You know, it's not about putting uh, women in the boardroom or something like that, because that still would be the Newtonian thing of replacing one, you know, um, cannonball with another. What she says is, is somehow much more provocative and, uh, and difficult. She says that the whole the essence of feminism is a certain multiplicity, a plurality. The world cannot be understood from one perspective. It cannot be understood according to one set of rules. There is a multiplicity of sets of rules. It might even mean that it, it's a mistake to consider time as unified <clears throat> and as, you know, or, uh, or space as um, understood from a single perspective. Because once you accept, once you take seriously the plurality that, that masculinity and femininity put forward, if you allow, if you reject one dominating the other, whether male dominating the female, or if you, if you reject the idea that one is the negative of the, of the other, or one is the a reflection of that, but say that there are two ways of being which completely co uh, coexist and um, equal in their force, for instance, then, then you need to apply that model to your understanding of, of the world, you know, down, down, down to understanding of physics. And she says that. Um, People got very angry with her because she was saying that uh, even this idea that um, light is kind of, according to uh, Einstein, is a kind of absolute measure of uh, uh, of speed, is also somehow embodies a kind of masculine ideal because <coughs> because that doesn't make sense. Does it make even a, a <laughs> I, 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 we were looking at anti-Oedipus mm -hmm. and, and I didn't understand at all actually when he was talking about identity in society being a matter of recording I think he said at one point that, that our identity is because our identity is there because we record it we measure it we kind of, um, and I wonder whether that kind of links in with Schrodinger do we have Maybe that's not the right do, word. Uh, do so we have antiodipus here? I would be interested. <coughs> I don't want to talk about um, about that without because I don't remember this passage that you mentioned, and I don't want to just talk about it um, irresponsibly. Um, because yeah, it's, it's, it's easy, you know, it's easy to say, oh yes, you know, of course Deleuze and Guattari, it's all very much drawn out of all this, um, out of indecidability and the indeterminacy. Um, but I would be, I would really like to look at, mm -hmm. at what exactly they say. Um, but you know, just consider it like that. <coughs> <coughs> what 
Well, as I told you earlier, because I'm coming to it from the perspective of photography, I was trying to look at the Schrodinger experiment in a photographic way, and it's quite easy to do, yeah? So that, that, that almost like a camera obscura with a pinhole with the opening here. So that, that's a camera. You could say, well, here is the photographic film. It's just that instead of film, we now have a bottle with poison, yeah? Um, but, but if this is a kind of photographic experiment that, made a rec that makes a recording, and then the recording is not a picture of a cat, but either a dead cat or a, a live cat, then, then you, well, what is it a recording of? What is actually being recorded here? Yeah? And what I want to suggest is that what is being recorded is not so much whether the cat is dead or alive, but the possibility of the the possibility of the difference between these narrations. The possibility of difference itself is being recorded or is being put forward by this experiment. So here, if this experiment produces an image, then it is exactly the image of the way difference comes into being. Yeah, and I think it would be interesting, um, not that we need to do it now, but it would be interesting to look at the Heideggerian notion of difference, of difference as perdurance, of difference as the leap out of metaphysics. What does it mean to leap out of metaphysics in the context of this, um, of in this context of physics? It, it's the leap out of this rational physics. It's the, it's the leap out of Newtonian physics. Now, where this leap is taking you, it's taking you to a place where the laws of motion, um, where you leave them behind, where you are in a kind of space that still makes sense, is not complete kind of chaos, but it's also not ruled by, by these laws. And what is... Kind of interesting is that the whole the whole conception of um, art as not dealing with representation, but with something less entirely, with, with something entirely different, something much more to do with um, some kind of uh, difference some kind of multiplicity um, can, can be drawn from the difference between these two observers. So does it come down in Heidegger, I think he uses the word the essence of metaphysics, doesn't he? So would it be the sort of essence, not the sense of a distillation, but the sort of the possibilities? Is that and what, what is the essence of metaphysics? What he, he calls it the ontotheological, mm. with dashes, ontotheological. It's interesting, isn't it? Onto be belongs to ontology. Theo belongs to theology. Logos belongs to logic. But he basically says it's all one thing. He says religion, reason, and philosophy, they all suffer from the same ill. They all start from the same problem, as, as we briefly mentioned before we started this, uh, this conversation. <clears throat> because they all take the same thing for granted. And what they take for granted, it's a different conversation, but basically they all take for granted that thinking or reason will get you to some kind of truth, will get you some kind of knowledge. That's why Heidegger says, no, look at a jar, look at the field, look at the painting. You know, don't look to reason for knowledge, because that is already contaminated with some kind of false assumption that thinking will get you to understanding, to truth. You know? And it's interesting again that Heidegger is very Nietzschean 
uh, in, uh, in this regard. And Nietzsche says that, uh, my philosophy, he says, is the first one that does not claim to be true. And he says that because he realizes that this idea that reason gets you to knowledge is itself kind of the, the root of the problem. You need to have a different method. You need to have a different way to go around. So, <coughs> so you see Schrodinger devised this experiment to show that it's ridiculous to apply quantum physics to everyday objects, to be something as big and complex as a cat. Um, so he wanted to expose the fallacy of uh, claiming that the indeterminacy that is inherent in quantum physics um, somehow can be extended into the real world, into the kind of the familiar physical world we inhabit. However, kind of the I think the result was exactly the opposite, because people took that very seriously, and and um, Karl Popper takes that very seriously as, a, as an example of the way uh, indeterminacy does operate in, um, in the real world. And so what is Popper's solution? So he says that we have the, we have the cloud on the one hand, and we have the clockwork on the other. And kind of until now, things were either or, either a cloud or a clock, either a clock or a cloud. <coughs> Popper suggests something quite revolutionary and very delicate. He says, what if we imagine that between the nebulous, indeterminate, chaotic cloud and the deterministic, rational clock somewhere here, there is a kind of membrane, or <clears throat> he calls it beautifully, he calls it plastic controls. Plastic control. Um, now, when he, well, he, this plastic control that he places between the indeterminacy of the quantum physics and the determinacy of Newtonian physics, he says, well, it's, it's things like our intentions, appetites, desires. That's where desire comes in. Um, libidinal economy. That's where he finds it all here. So let's say, let, let's say, libidinal desire. So, <clears throat> so what he suggests is that <clears throat> Uh, the, the example he brings in, uh, he, he gives in this lecture, he says, well, the fact that I'm standing here in front of you today is not totally random, not totally, it might be unfortunate, he says, <laughs> and you might agree with him. Uh, um, it might be unfortunate, but it's not an accident. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, on the other hand, it's also not fully deterministic. There are, you know, Perhaps some noting something in the diary and buying a train ticket and setting up an alarm clock and leaving the house at a certain time uh, and just you know deciding if that's exactly that that's the thing you're going to do today and not something else. All these things played part in the fact, you know, that um, he or me, or, you know, or, or we are here at this moment. Yeah. So there's both elements of. Um, determinism and indeterminism, but they are being processed through 
this um, kind of mesh of uh, wants and needs and desires and appetites. <coughs> and I think, jumping a little bit forward, that this is quite an interesting way of thinking about, for instance, the world we inhabit right now with the internet and the computers and perhaps even the journalism that, that, that you mentioned. Sorry, I don't know your name. Kirsten. Kirsten. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, that, that might be an interesting way of thinking about um, journalism and, uh, <clears throat> and how this notion of, uh, of plastic controls, it's almost like, a, you can say, well, how, how exactly the transaction is taking place between the world of computers, which is computational, and kind of the physical world that we inhabit here. Um, how computers learn about us and how we learn about them, I mean, where, where, is the, where is the transaction taking place? And uh, using that model, you could almost say that um, there is a kind of uh, certain structures which act as a kind of plastic control. For instance, um, one, one example that um, I've been using for a while, let's say you take a photograph and you put it online. Yeah, I could t t take a picture of my cat. And... Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, on the way here, I said, I have promised to myself that I will not mention MasterChef. So, <laughs> so, yeah, but, but, but there will be many cats. So, uh, so okay, I put, the, I put the picture of a cat, of, of a cat online. Fine. Um, or I'd say I upload it to um, Flickr, or I put it on a blog. The computer really has no way of knowing what it is. As far as the computer is concerned, it's just a string of numbers. Yeah, can you tell that it's a cat, that his name is Ludo, you know, that he's two year old, and he has a inflammation with his teeth, it's a, it's a massive concern. <laughs> but, uh, no, he cannot, the computer cannot know any of these things. Um, however, I can go in and I can tag this image in different ways, and I can say, Ludo, two-year-old, Maine Coon, um, you know, poor teeth, painful, something like that. Uh, now, so suddenly this image is already not completely invisible to the computer. The tags or the keywords or normally they are called tags, but the, it's just in some ways it's called metadata that you can attach to any image or a file allows the computer to communicate with this in a very different way. So next time you go to a search engine and you type in, uh, in to Google Maine Coon, this image might pop up because it's already tagged in a certain way. Yeah? So instead of being just a knowable string of numbers for the computer, it becomes something that actually uh, acquires, so the computer kind of learned, strangely, something about our world. Yeah, I know, I know it's a very primitive way of describing how it works, but, but it helps, otherwise it just gets um, too confusing. So it's almost like this act of tagging or metadata. Um, it's like this um, plastic control, but perhaps on this scale, this is the computer, the, the clockwork thing. This is the cloud. This is me. And, um, and that's how some kind of um, exchange is taking place. And it could be, you could also say that it also works the other way. But the other way, I think it's quite easy to understand. What is more, what is more peculiar is how computers keep learning about us. You know, and how <clears throat> there are so many structures online designed to teach the computer about us. You know, very often these, um, they are disguised as uh, social games. One way to think about social media, for instance, if, if anyone here is interested in thinking about social media, um, is just a massive experiment or a massive exercise in teaching computers about humans 
disguised as a kind of site of social interaction. Really, so the social interaction, the friendships, the likes and unlikes, um, and all this kind of flirting that goes on, um, is just kind of the debate, maybe, to um, allow the computers to accumulate a large body of data. There are lots of you know, quite well-known examples of um, how that works, how, for instance, um, <coughs> for a while, for, for, um, for a while, Google was um, had a sort of service in, in, the, in the USA where you could call in and uh, speak up someone's name and it would search uh, through, through its address book and give you its phone number. It was just all operated by voice. Um, and then they stopped that. But the reason they ran it for a few years is because they wanted to accumulate all the possible accents and all the possible ways of pronouncing. And now they have their own kind of voice recognition software, which is very effective because it's, it uses all that knowledge. Yeah. So we're kind of also um, coming around to talk about the, the whole Twitter thing a little bit. Because you could almost say, if Twitter is something you're interested to think about, you could almost see how this model of um, plastic control is kind of in between the half ounce between the cloud and the clock. Um, might give a way of thinking about something like like Twitter. You could say that perhaps the hashtags um, is exactly the way <coughs> by which something libidinal, something of the desire comes in. And you know, did you uh, notice this story in the news a couple of weeks ago about a, a girl who was uh, chosen to be a police commissioner. Mm -hmm. I mean, the strange world we live in. <laughs> and then she, um, she'd been in the post the whole of six hours, I think, um, before someone discovered comments she made in Facebook when she was 14 or something like that. And then she had to resign. Uh, and her life basically not ruined. Did she resign again? Yeah. She has to resign. Yeah. 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 And her, you know, her life is basically finished. It's just, <laughs> 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 let's see. That's it. That's 60. Uh, yeah, and um, <clears throat> so it's, um, so he somehow proposed, um, well, um, A way, of, a way of thinking outside the binaries, or outside the dualism, just I just finished this one sentence, outside the dualisms of body and mind, subject and object. Because, because you know, as, as Westerners, as the heirs to the Jews and the Greeks, we love to have these clear-cut distinctions. You know, this is the body, that is the mind, this is the image, that is the object. This is reality, that's a dream. Other cultures are not so keen to have these distinctions. They have to have gray areas. So you can have ghosts, and you can even take photographs of ghosts, and you know, and you can have spirits, and you can converse with spirits. And it's kind of, I think, a bit more comfortable to live when you have this gray area, when the body and the mind kind of mingle and interact and in a sense, the rationalist, the positivist Karl Popper proposed something that kind of fixed our model with these plastic controls, allowing us to sidestep these, these rigid dualisms. And um, yeah, I'll come back. So, what do you want to say? Um, <laughs> it was related to your meta text. Yeah. Comment. Uh huh. Um, the idea of a computer knowing yeah. something yeah. versus a computer acting on something. Uh -huh. So knowing suggests, so I'm referring to the issues of artificial intelligence, yes. the idea that um, a computer can know something yeah. versus a computer can act yeah. on a bunch of known in variables in a closed environment. Yeah. That's not knowing, that's acting that's right. on the information that it has. Mm -hmm. So I still see the, this process of 
Metatonia yeah. is clockwork. Um, I think you're it's, right. It's, I, I it's the control mechanism where we, as the human, defines what the computer is allowed to know. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I see. I see what you're saying, and I think you are right in saying that. My, my, my example. Mm -hmm. So my, my example would be al algorithms knowing. Yeah. My example would be um, the, the case in the US of uh, is it Target. The it's like a, it's like Tesco. The, the, the equivalent. Yeah, of, yeah, um, yeah, Tesco, and they have uh, they have the equivalent of the Tesco Club card, the Target yeah, Club card. Yeah, yeah. Now the the Target card allows you to go to the store, buy, yeah, yeah. and then they track that data. Then they don't know something about you, but they've got a list of your buying preferences. Yeah. Now, six months ago, they, they sent a um, they sent a coupon to a sixteen year old girl in the U.S. for uh, money off diapers, and her father phoned up Target and went, uh, "Are you trying to encourage my daughter to get pregnant?" And they went, "No, no, no, the, uh, she is pregnant." And he went, "No, she isn't." And it turns out she was. Mm -hmm. And in the press, they wrote that as Target knew that she yeah. was pregnant. Yeah. Well, Target didn't know anything. Target had an algorithm that was working um, on known vectors in the closed yeah. environment, which was their database of yeah. buying preferences. Yeah. And then that database acted on something. Yeah. So it may look like it knew that she was pregnant, yeah. but it was just acting on a certain amount of information that equals symbol of pregnant, not knowing what pregnant means. Yeah. Pregnant to Target's database means buying, well, she bought pregnancy tests. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, mm -hmm. and then they went, oh, pregnancy test, pregnancy. Yeah. So I, I still struggle to, I, I think of anything, that idea of the meta tagging at that very um, uh, language level, at the very symbolic yeah. level of that equals x. Yeah. The, the other thing about meta tagging is there's no standards either. Exactly. So it's messy. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and plastic most. controls are messy. Right. That's 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 what makes them so interesting. They are messy. You know, desire and libido are messy things. That's precisely. So, 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 you you are absolutely right. So how do we? Mm. So how do we go from? So let's let's go back to your yeah. your, your cat. Yeah. So Google's big push at the moment about yeah. machine vision, or yeah. machine learning, especially with the, the move towards Google Glass, yeah. where everything will be recognisable. Yeah. So you've tagged as cat. Uh huh. Now, a machine learning system could look at a whole bunch of images that yeah. are tagged as cat and then determine, say, the colours of certain pixels, the percentage of colours of certain pixels that equals cat. They could work out what a cat is, but a Google um, sort of machine eye to use. Yeah. Very metaphorical term. Couldn't see a cat in the cloud. No. In the same way that the human could go, oh, that, that was only mm. a cat. Mm. The machine vision couldn't mm. have the same yeah. sort of yeah. woolliness. Mm. It's something, it's right. it's something about it. it knows only the representation level. Yeah. Well, right. I, you know, when I'm saying that the computer knows, of course, it's it's not precise language, um, and you're right that you know. But isn't that a problem? The way in which we talk about computers, the way in which we talk about algorithms, as it's one of the problems. It's not yeah. the only one. Um, I also, you know, one one counter argument, which I'm not saying it's not necessarily mine, would be to say that, you know, um, in the same way that Target didn't know that this woman was pregnant, she also didn't know that she's pregnant, because. Her, the way her brain works and the way the synapses uh, that work in her brain work in not in a not dissimilar way to the way you know the data works in a computer. See, I, I worry about so, so, so the clockwork, the yeah. clockwork yeah. idea. Despite the clockwork plan, mm -hmm. it comes also from a metaphor, mm -hmm. a dominant metaphor of yeah. that age. Yeah. The, the idea of uh, when you're thinking about something, the cogs are turning in your brain. Mm. Um, but now it's the, the idea that your brain is processing yeah. ideas, the, yeah. this, this 
change to an informational metaphor, which is it's cloud to clock well, to you, something else now, you which we want to have as a system of control, back to a system of control via the information metaphor, the idea that the human brain equals information is another form of control as I see it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I was saying that. And um, I mean, well, you, you, you will like Penrose because he says exactly that. He says he attacks the, what, what he calls strong artificial intelligence argument. It basically right. says a brain, you know what I'm talking about, yeah? yeah, yeah. Says, no, a brain is a computer. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's so yeah, but but you know, we're not going there. No, I'm not. I'm at all not suggesting that at all. Um, I'm um, he, he, according to Pedro's uh, minds or brains and computers will never be equivalent because thinking is inseparable from having a body. You know, thinking is not happening in some kind of brain in a jar, but it's it's a physical activity for which. You need a body. You think with a body. Um, so, um, so you, you you will find a strong ally here, and um, and it is it is misleading to talk about computers as knowing. It's also misleading, I think, to talk about people as knowing. You know, <laughs> talking about knowledge can be can be misleading. So I, I take your point. Did you want to say? That? No, I was just going to be saying that the argument about how. Computers have evolved at a sort of exponential rate over a very short period of time, but if you think of the brains that are processing, as well, life as a processing organism has been evolving for 4.5 billion years, it's a very slow, something that's mm -hmm. it's very slowly been turning and building things up, but with technology at the exponential growth, it's perhaps been forced to move at that rate where it's not picking up certain nodal points, bits of difference, and yeah, there's different different ways of knowing those different rates of building up a, I suppose, a program of learning, of working, is quite different, there's quite a big gap between how they developed. Let me put it to you like this, just, just, just to make it simple. In the same way that you wouldn't say that, let's say, um, a piece of food you pick from the ground, you know, like um, is a is an artificial arm or artificial limb. And you wouldn't also say that a computer is an artificial brain, but it kind of points in the direction. You know, when uh, when you when you lift a, a stick from the ground. You know, you, you, you make the first step towards developing in the distant future some kind of artificial arm. And the computer is, in a very nascent form, shows us what um, thinking is capable of doing. And while computers are, you know, uh, infinitesimally um, minuscule compared to what, you know, people can do with their, um, with their mind, they, they, they already allow us to do some things which are quite interesting. So with the help of the computer, we can travel into different dimensions. So for instance, we could travel into this subatomic dimension where the laws, the Newtonian laws don't apply and instead statistical laws apply. Yeah? And you could travel even further into kind of quark dimensions where even statistical laws don't, don't apply and there is something else entirely where there is where it's very hard to even draw a distinction between the object and its symbol um, and that indicates to some extent that the distinctions we drew between let's say subject and object mind and body um, they are useful for a very narrow part of reality within the kind of molecular world, these Newtonian laws apply and work. But outside them, whether you go to something very big or something very small, uh, they, don't, they don't apply. And you, then you need different laws. So um, William Flusser, who is a very interesting um, philosopher of technology, he says that reality is made like Russian dolls 
from, uh, for, from nested worlds. And the world we explored for a very long time was just this doll of a uh, molecular doll that works according to the Newtonian laws. But the moment you step out, you get, you get into different layers, and the laws there are very different. And so that also means that the distinct that the subject object, mind, body, um, image object, all these dualisms, their value is limited to this very narrow territory. And and they definitely seem to be problematic in trying to understand the network with them, or the internet with them, because not least because the internet is all working on kind of uh, extremely high speeds and uh, electrons. No? Um, <clears throat> so while while the network or the the, the computer computers they have a physical dimension in in as much as they are kind of present in the physical molecular mo molecular world, um, they also part of them operate in a very different world. You know why? How? Why is it if I upload the photograph on this computer here, it is also instantly available uh, in Australia? You know, how, how, how is that possible in a three-dimensional world? You know, clearly <laughs> there is something else. The 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 you, then you need to account for infinite, for um, for the speed of light, for instance. You need, then you need to account for the way um, electrons move, which is very different to the way cannonballs or ch tables and chairs move. So we already live within, we already surrounded ourselves with other very real and visible layers of existence, which have nothing to do with the physical world. Our problem, as far as I understand it, and I might be completely wrong here, but our problem is not that we surround ourselves with this layer, with this other layers of existence, but that we try, we keep trying to comprehend them with the perspective of the laws of physics. And we keep getting results. <laughs> but we only get the results that we can get with these tools. If we take different tools, and if I may say so, I think the whole um, what John is trying to do is precisely to say that for this new multi-layered cake we live in, we also need different tools. When people talk about paradigm shifts, when people talk about post-metaphysical thinking, that's basically what is being said. You know, um, this, meta this metaphysics, whether, even if you uh, don't agree with Heidegger, and even if you accept the Cartesian distinction between body and mind and the whole metaphysical shabang, you still will need to admit that there are dimensions of our existence where it does not apply. Yeah, that's kind of the whole point. That's why. I mean, what's why we talk today, for instance, about the Les and Guattari? They are they are already dead for twenty years. You know. They've been writing in the 80s, in the 70s. Why do we keep talking about them? Well, for one thing, is that they took seriously the notion of the network. And Thousand Plateaus, which is a really difficult and irritating in many levels, an annoying and impossible book, it's the attempt to make sense of the network as something as a very different layer of existence to the Newtonian action-reaction cause and effect situation. You know, it was their attempt to say the whole areas of being that cannot be accounted with these tools. Yeah? So, so you see this is really why I think Art is the practice of philosophy. Because it's almost like um, when you look at James Joyce, Finnegan's Wake, for instance, when you look at um, you know, high modernism, Kafka, I mean, the, 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 these are kind of the favorite examples 
of the, the, the Latin Quadragon cells, um, modernist music, um, you see that um, these are precisely the concerns that, that um, animate art throughout the 20th century. Um, how, to, how to account for that which lies outside of the narrow path of rationality? And um, I think last time I spoke with you, I mentioned the notion of the, the concept of the pharmacon, which is, uh, which is a Greek word, um, the pharmacon. And it, um, it was put to, to great use by Derrida in, um, in this essay, um, Plato's Pharmacy, where he says that pharmacon is an interesting concept because it is, uh, it is a medicine, which is also a poison. Yeah? But it's it's the, it's this one thing that can either cure or kill, and this is the kind of it's, it it tries to indicate a kind of concept that within the Western tradition we don't know how to accommodate. How how to accommodate the idea that the course of of um, medicine prescribed by the good doctor also is uh, can be deadly or it can be beneficial, can be benign, or it can be malignant. The same thing. We don't like that. We want to know for certain, you know. Um, and it's not a question of side effects. We kind of got used to side effects. It's much more complex, um, or maybe it's more simple. It's, it's a question of being both poison and cure. And um, And that also means, if you take that seriously, that also means that the whole notion of truth, of something final and valid, like Newton's laws, is in that. If you take the notion of the pharmacon, uh, of, of this inherent ambiguity, uncertainty, um, if you take it seriously, then you have to admit that science that wants to proceed along the lines of certainty and causality and um, rational procedure will always will, will not be able to account for large parts of life which are not like that. Yeah, I think you you are dealing with uh, with spirits. Aren't yeah. You? yeah, I was just thinking because we went to a talk by Rupert Sheldrake, and uh, he was talking about the fact that he'd gone back in history and he'd studied um, uh, the the measurement of the speed of light, and that within a twenty year time period, the speed of light had dropped drastically. And he'd kind of visited the um, the research units that had studied this, and he was just like. Why has this been covered up? The fact that it just drastically dropped around the whole globe and nobody kind of acknowledged it. Um, and they just say, basically, he just kind of said because it would disturb the whole kind of idea of there being a rational law and that it is constant and that it's not changing. And he obviously talks about the fact that he's trying to establish that you can't have these constants because the universe is continuously expanding. Uh, um, yeah, it's just the idea that within physics, if we if we completely got rid of physics, I mean, I don't know how many people here actually believe that you can measure the speed of light. People believe that, because I don't think you can do that. I mean, we've created laws that we supposedly think, okay, well, we're going to have a number, but I mean, a number in itself, what does that mean? How do we understand it? How does it kind of function? So I find the whole thing, <laughs> maybe it's because I believe in kind of other, um, other, uh, the other, but <laughs> let's just leave it at that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just find it quite confusing that we continually come back to, well, we come back to the idea of the rational because we have to have something that functions. And I, I think that's how I see it, why everybody essentially needs some way of functioning and having some kind of understanding. But I don't think that everybody necessarily believes that it's true. And, and often the irrational is, is kind of um, presented as very rational as well. Yeah. As well. So we kind of make all sorts of irrational things that we do extremely irrational. But the fact that we la we label them as irrational itself 
means that we're trying to rationalise the fact that they were rational with, yeah. with that dualism as well, yeah. and it's just like, I mean, that is mm. limiting in itself, that mm. you have to say, okay, I've experienced something, and I now have to say that it's an irrational experience, mm. because it doesn't fit within certain laws. But it is, isn't to some extent that's what Leotard is doing in libidinal economy? Mm. You know, because I think the what, what, what you are talking about, um, like the other, is it's it's the libidinal, mm -hmm. or sometimes he also calls it calls it the pagan. And what what does it mean to you remember that he spoke, speaks about the pagan pagan theatric? What does it mean to say that something is pagan? We are so used to monotheism, not only as the idea that there is one God, but also as the idea that there is one reason, there is one logic. And I think I'm slightly concerned with, with, with people, when people talk about rational and irrational <clears throat> because it might seem that rationality follows certain logic and irrationality has no logic. No. I mean, what, what people like uh, Leotard and to some extent the Lesnar Bhattari and Derrida at pains to point out is that the irrational is also a logic. It's another logical procedure. It's just a different logical procedure. Nietzsche calls it the gay science. Yeah, there is a it's a wonderful book of his, the gay science, um, <clears throat> gay as in um, um, well ecstatic or uh, jolly uh, or even just simply happy. Um, it's the the science of ecstasy, but it's still a science. Yeah, um, it's not so. You know, going back to this is all kind of neatly fits, or maybe not, not very neatly, um, within, within this um, within this, uh, this notion that the, the whole distinction to, between clouds and clocks obliterates the, the place where you can have something like libidinal economy, gay science, and a logic which is not necessarily the rational logic, but still allows you to do things, still allows you to go somewhere, or to perform something. Johnny probably spoke with you uh, on, uh, about um, telos, yeah, and, how, uh, and the unfolding, and how you start from the acorn and you grow into the, into the big tree. So that's that's the clock model, yeah. Um, and but if you, as Jerry says, if you want, if you start from the acorn, but you want to be something else, then it will not do just to discard all kinds of reason. You still need a kind of method, yeah. And so, so it looks like Popper proposes something like a methodology for an artist, a methodology for doing art, which puts together something like the other, as you say, Grace, something like the libido or the appetite or desire together with the algorithmic structure of the computer and maybe um, maybe also the algorithmic structure of the brain I mean here we kind of um, we don't really know he, he, he writes this whole book uh, trying to figure out if the brain is select something like a computer and he doesn't really find um, an answer the bomb will find out Sorry? I'm <laughs> far more fun. Have you heard about the brain project? No. The R. The A. Was it the brain something neuroscience scanning? So they've gone from NASA. Their mum's just put 10 billion into scanning human brains. Mm -hmm. There's a political reason for that. Yeah. What is it? Which. Um, this is a gentleman who wants to close uh, interrogation camps. Yeah. And a lot of the brain science scientists that he's working with are looking at uh, inducing images into brains. Uh huh. So they show them images from YouTube and then play that back to them and then they are able to 
identify certain images that have been uh, that have shown up in those images from YouTube, or the brain finds similarity between other images. Um, so if you want to get terrorists to say they've been doing certain bombings, just show them those images a couple of times, <laughs> and just scan their brains. Um, it's foolproof, supposedly. It's not. It's a really worrying project. VR is his brain, it's, it's the acronym is brain, I can't remember what it stands for, that's something. Um, neuroscience. That VR. Yeah. Um, but that's why, because that's flying on the back of this, uh, you know, this, this issue that we have in a, a neoliberalist society, we can have Peter Singer, that guy's at one end going, well, we're just over evolved animals, and because, well, guys at the other end going, well, we're just, you know, bodies that are transportation systems to this thing called the brain. And so the US is putting a whole bunch of research into neuromania, brain science, scanning the brain to turn it into a computational entity. For what means we still don't quite know. We certainly won't be flying near a convoy, isn't it? So well, uh, very... Kat Catherine Hales, quite well known for, yeah. the, for a book she wrote, you probably heard of it, it's called How We Became Posthuman. And where she basically, she, she, she takes on board this whole kind of the military industrial complex mm -hmm. and its ideas about, you know, the brain as a computer and, you know, the whole military investments in that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an old book, but, but it's, it's, it's well known for, this, for the claim it makes, which kind of, um, I think, similar to what uh, Penrose is saying here, that, um, you know, in... At its basis, all these ideas you're talking about, about scanning the brain, they're very Cartesian ideas. They're based on the assumption that you can separate the brain from the body. First, first they're based on the assumption that the mind is in the brain. And so therefore, scanning the brain, you're not just scanning one organ among many, but you kind of really get access to thinking, to consciousness, to cognition. Um, and you can do all that by um, with completely um, without taking in any account of the body. So according to, 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 to the thing that you described, um, you know, you can scan someone's brain and kind of recreate it somewhere else and you know the, the body kind of becomes um, irrelevant. So this title how it became post human is is ironic in that sense. Because according to her, we can we we, we can never become post-human, we, 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 we can never become post-body, because the, the, because the body is kind of the seat of thinking and consciousness. But it's quite interesting, I think, how we live in the moment where these questions are really um, quite, quite acute, because we have, you know, artificial life in, in different forms, and um, um, you know, so the, what I was, what I was just listening the other day about um, a goat that was genetically modified to produce to produce spider silk in its milk. Yeah, did you hear about that? Yeah. Which is really, I mean, quite disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe everything that technology can do is being so limited by this model mm -hmm. in almost a trivial way but if, but the outcomes are extremely dangerous such as this idea of the brain project which in a lot of ways is so kind of you know ridiculous and thoughtless and, and, and really just for the for a military gain or for a power gain or for a monetary gain or something like that and there's a, there's a lot of frustration, isn't there, about the fact that this amazing technology that we've got is just doing these three things, really, which is kind of making certain people more powerful, which is getting Tesco's a little bit more money um, and by selling nappies to 16-year-old pregnant people. And the military is able to have this completely reductive um, and narrow, old-fashioned idea of harnessing terrorist brains and changing them, um, which is just completely depressing, really, that we have, that on one hand we have this amazing possibility, but 
there's no concept, we're not able to conceive of actually using it in any way. But, but isn't that exactly what Heidegger is uh, talking about? In did, did you look at the question yeah. concerning technology? You probably yes. did, yeah? yeah? So it, it all really comes out of that. But I think what, what, what I find really amazing, and maybe on that we can, we can um, finish, is that um, how little actually in cultural studies, in media studies, uh, how little people notice this, uh, this Heideggerian argument. It is as if, you know, the, the Cartesian dualistic model, the rationalistic model, um, was never challenged, as if representation is still the way by which knowledge and the world are given. It's true that the world is given as a representation, but that's the problem. It's not, that's not something to take as a given, but something to investigate and challenge. Um, so, um, I think I think we can probably... Uh, I just wondered yeah. at the end, just before, the, yeah. there's a lot of focus on the sort of the computers doing this, yeah. and, the computer, and the computers learning yeah. from us, yeah. but I wonder where it could be the idea that by our activities as we are, that embrace yeah. everything, that the, the planet is in effect learning from us in, and changing its value as well, so the planet has a, has a clock, mm. so we think you know, global warming, you know, if you put aside the argument of it doesn't exist, mm. but... Mm the changes, whether that's just, is that another incidence of what we're discussing? So mm -hmm. the yeah, sort of, so, is this Jim Yeah, that's no, right, the sort of guy that's around, around to, to mm -hmm. think, yeah. But, but it's, is it also the, the case that, that yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> a lot of the, kind of, a lot of the Gaia movement, kind of coming out of phenomenology, and of, of Heideggerian, we were thinking so to the extent that Heidegger sometimes sounds to us very familiar, mm. even if we didn't read him, is because his ideas kind of went through this Gaia movement and came round as this notion that you know we have a responsibility for the world. Mm. You know, we, the world is not just for us to use and exploit and convert into energy and resources uh, and. Uh, and valorize, but we also have, we are also the, the carers, yeah, the, yeah, the shepherds, yeah, yeah, the, um, so the, that, 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 that kind of the, one of, one of these strange um, Heideggerian legacies, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what to say to, to, to your question about, um, you know, about kind of the, yeah. the, the, the state of the planet, like according to Heidegger, it's very clear what, to, mm -hmm. how, how it was, as long as we view uh, technology as a tool to use, we will always be a little bit unhuman. We will always end up looking at ourselves and at others as tools as well. And when you see other people as tools, you end up looking at yourself as a tool, you, you also lose your humanity. Because your humanity is in seeing the yourself as a shepherd of being and and how your no your relationship to being as a shepherd as a carer comes into force it comes into force through labor through doing here Heidegger is surprisingly Marxist because he says I mean basically well, what is technology in the question of technology is work is labor so he says the moment you start doing something with your hands whether it is a pot or building a hut um, you find yourself in dialogue with being. And, and that's why, I mean, I, I, I was um, thinking how hard would it be to really get yourself out of technology? Because I think, I think we spoke about it the other time, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but even if you strip naked, if you leave everything behind and run into the woods, and you say, okay, God, I'm free of technology, fine. And then what you do? then you will build a shelter. So you are back in technology. And the moment you build a shelter, you are again in this relationship. And, and for Heidegger, that, because you see, Marx already saw that. 
he already saw that it is through work that we become who we are. But because he was a dialectician, because he was an idealist, he, he still said um, labor comes first and thoughts, ideas, poetry, art, theater, that comes after. You first build the foundations, you, you, you create the economy, this is the kind of the, the material conditions of living, and all the um, cultural conditions, the, the superstructure, that kind of comes later. Yeah? And Heidegger follows him to that way of thinking, but he wants to, he says, yeah, but if you think in that way, you already presuppose some kind of rational arrangement. First the basis, then the second floor. First the material, then the spiritual. Heidegger says, but then you already presuppose this rationality. So you're never going to really extract yourself from being enslaved by your own reason. So what he proposes is a slight, he in a sense deconstructs Marx by saying, these conditions of labor that Marx is talking about, they are already poetic. It's not that you first build the house and then you sit and write a poem. It's the building itself is already a poem. You know, it, it has a, because it is creative, because it is um, making something out of nothing, because you are in dialogue. So all these things, which for Marx were ideas that come after you secure your foundation, for Heidegger, they are part and parcel. And in that way, very cleverly, he completely sidesteps the dualisms, the Cartesian dualisms that still hound Marx, Marxist thought. Because, and that's kind of the argument that people like Leotard and, and everyone who criticizes this kind of traditional Marxism, the problem is that it's still metaphysical. Because if you put, let's say, labor as the basis, then the proletariat or the, the class system becomes the foundation on which you build your um, model. Uh, but you already allowed for um, the notion of a structure to somehow be outside and never be really questioned. Nothing within the Marxist system allows to question this structure, first the basis, then ideas, first material, then spiritual, first, uh, let's say, first bread, then culture. Um, so Heidegger quickly sidesteps it by saying they're just together. That is the belonging together. It's the belonging together of labor and poetry, of bread and theater. They are, they are one and the same. They are, they are never separate. And as long as we, the, the moment we can see them as one and the same, we will already perform this leap out of metaphysics. <coughs> yeah? You can't work with both, though. You can't. You can't. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what art does, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, what, isn't, isn't that why art is so important for Heidegger? Because what, what a painter does, a painter labors or let's say a sculptor labors like a mason, works with stone. And what is the difference? Here someone works with stone and here someone works with stone. But the, the artist works with stone while making art, while making something which is both material and cultural, and it's all kind of together. Well, with a mason, we don't see that. We see only the, the material, but, but he says, yes, you can work with both. And then, you know, do you know Joseph Beuys, Joseph uh, Beuys, uh, the German artist? He, I think, very clearly takes on board this Heideggerian notion. Um, that, and his, his famous statement is that everyone is an artist. Yeah? And people often misunderstand it. You know, they, 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 as if kind of he means that, you know, whatever you do is art. That, that I think, is, is really quite, uh, quite simplistic. I think what he, he intends to, to say that in the act of making in the act of labor and work, there is al already a poetry. 
Um, so yeah, that, and, and isn't that exactly why um, for all this group of philosophers that we are interested in, um, art is really the key. Sometimes uh, more uh, important than even politics because um, it shows how these dualisms of matter and ideas can be superseded. The person who does it very clearly uh, and beautifully is, is of course Adorno in aesthetic theory. It's really quite, uh, quite wonderful book. Um, so what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to keep ch chatting to you. It's very nice. <laughs> but if you, if you think that we have enough, you can also call it a day. What do you think? <laughs> what was the name of your uh, your algorithm paper? You, oh, um, I I will send you. Um, I may no, I don't think I, I'm online yet because I have it on the iPad. I will send it to Grace. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's uh, it is about the Schrodinger scanner and link there. I think I hope I'm explaining it a little better. But the thing with these things is it's. It's just not uh, not easy to talk about. Yeah. And um, do you have a kind of do you have a discussion group online? No. no. <laughs> you should set up something like that. Yeah. When 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 um, when we were studying in uh, Greenwich, we had uh, a kind of we called it the philosopher's salon. And saloon, and so on. <laughs> and uh, and then we had kind of quite quite good online discussions, which were kind of quite separate from the meetings with Johnny. And people would sometimes post things they found, and uh, so it's quite good. Me too. Yeah, master chef. It is a well, yeah. Don't, 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 don't Pictures get, of their cats. Don't, 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 don't get to start it because this series, the current series, is so disappointing. Oh. <laughs> but I think it's something. There's something very interesting about this. There is a whole range of TV programs that are exact repetition week after week. Yeah. Like I think The Apprentice was exemplary. Yeah. How it was to the minute yeah. like the same thing. And isn't that what makes it so kind of enticing? No, <laughs> but you just know exactly. You know that there will be a phone call. The secretary will <laughs> leave the phone with hand pushing the the kind of milky glass door. And why do you it so? What, what what is it about having this exact identity? And where nothing's happening, where you, where everything's clouded, you can't see. You're just waiting, waiting, waiting. So you the actually whole program the whole series. <laughs> so are, so are you are you, are you watching it hand. to see how everything is the same? Is that what is so? Uh, because it was it was very good television. Well, the thing it? of knowing nothing, the thing of knowing nothing for ages and ages and ages, and waiting to find out, aren't you? That's 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 the kind of masochistic. Drive. The winners, there would be, it would be down to the final two. Yeah, the winner yeah. actually wasn't decided for 18 months or so. So, yeah, yeah. 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 so that even that waiting was sort of false. Yeah, it's that, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Well, yeah, obviously not. It's sort of <laughs> false, but, um, yeah. but yes, even, you know, it's these yeah. two separate things going on as well. I hope you will be reading uh, Difference and Repetition, the Deleuze's uh, masterpiece. I think that, that that really helps to make sense of it all. Of Master Chef. Of Master Chef. <laughs> <laughs> because once you understand Master Chef, you understand everything. <laughs> well, then I think that the only way is Essex to visit all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.